And again, today you can um, uh, see the, the slides and presentation at the link that are being shown in the chat here. Um, so with that, I would like to welcome our speaker today. This is Dr. Fritz Carl. He's an independent consultant and a lecturer at UC Berkeley and at the University of San Francisco. He's worked on many different aspects and scales of the electricity system, from wholesale markets to distributed energy, and has been a regular contributor to the work at the Berkeley Lab. Dr. Carl received his PhD from the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley and his BA in Philosophy from the College of William and Mary. Today, we also have another co-author of the report joining us for the Q&A session at the end. That's James Hyung Kwang Kim. James is a project scientist at the Berkeley Lab in the Electricity Markets and Policy Department. Uh, and he conducts research on market policy along with the value and costs of power systems technologies. James holds a PhD in applied economics from Purdue University, an MS in economics from Brunei University, and a BA in computer science and industrial engineering from Yonsei University. So with that, I'd like to welcome Fritz. And again, uh, uh, I'll, I'll put the, the link to the PowerPoint deck that he's gonna be going over and um, uh, the paper into the link. So take it away, Fritz. Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Today's webinar is going to provide an overview of some recent work that we've done around wind and solar generation participation in US ancillary services or AS markets. Um, so James Kim, Andrew Ryan Weiser, Chris Crespo Montañas, and Will Gorman all contributed to this work. Um, presentation today is gonna to be about 30 to 35 minutes and then we'll open up for Q&A. This topic, ancillary services markets, can be a little bit on the arcane side. That's probably an understatement. I mean, the presentation is going to assume a certain level of background knowledge with AS markets, but we can also use the Q&A session to clarify any questions about terminology or how AS markets work, in addition to fielding questions around the report. Okay. So first, a, a quick bit of background and motivation. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been a growing, growing interest in having wind and solar generation participate in AS markets. And there are a couple of drivers for this. One reason is that renewable energy developers are starting to look for additional sources of value to offset declining energy and capacity value. So AS markets could be one potential source of new revenues. Second reason is that higher penetrations of wind and solar are starting to create uh, new operating challenges for system operators. So from more of a system perspective, having wind and solar provide AS would help to expand the toolkit that system operators have to address these challenges, um, which in turn will help to promote lower cost solutions. There's been a significant amount of research and demonstration in the US and Europe showing that wind and solar can technically provide things like regulation and operating reserves, but at least in the US there's been less work to, done to understand the economic and regulatory questions around having wind and solar uh, generation participate in AS markets. And thus far, wind and solar haven't really been participating in these markets. So our aim in the study was to use a relatively simple approach with transparent, consistent assumptions to better understand two main questions. First, what's the incremental value of AS market participation for wind and solar owners in each of the seven ISO RTO markets, both for standalone wind and solar projects and for hybrid wind and solar projects that are paired with battery storage? Incremental value here means what are the incremental revenues from participating in AS markets relative to just participating in energy markets? I mean, then a second question is, what is the value of allowing wind and solar generation to part participate in AS markets from more of a system perspective? Again, across the different ISO RTO markets. For this system value question, you can think of it more in terms of the conditions under which uh, wind and solar, uh, standalone and hybrid wind and solar would provide AS. Are these periods of high price, high AS prices when the system is constrained, or are these periods of, of uh, lower AS prices when there are already low cost ways in which system operators can provide reserves? In terms of AS products, our focus in these two questions is more narrowly on regulation reserve markets and to a lesser extent, spinning reserve markets. To provide some context for the results, it's important to first understand that AS markets are very different across ISOs, RTOs. They have different, ISOs, RTOs have different AS products and procurement practices, and how AS prices are formed in different markets can also be quite different. 
As we'll discuss later, these differences in AS market design have a significant impact on the results. Second thing to note about uh, prices in US AS markets is that they vary significantly from year to year as a result of changing fuel costs, loads, hydropower availability and constraints, and changes in market design and AS procurement practices. So the figure on the right here shows uh, zonal AS market prices that we're using in the study for each of the seven ISOs RTOs, um, which illustrates both the differences in prices among ISOs RTOs and the significant amount of of year-to-year -year variability in prices. So these are our uh, regulation prices. Oops. Three different differences among ISOs, RTO, uh, ISO, RTO markets are most important for this, for this analysis. The most important of these differences is differences in regulation products. So regulation reserves, just for, for reference, are what system operators uh, used for balancing the system on a second to second and a minute to minute basis. They address imbalances within the five minute real time dispatch interval. Three of the ISOs, RTOs, Cal ISO, ERCOT, and SPP procure separate upward and downward regulation products, whereas the remaining four procure bi directional regulation. Bi directional regulation means the regulation resource has to hold an equal amount of reserve capacity in the upward and downward directions whereas separate upward and downward regulation, with, with separate upward and downward regulation, a resource only needs to hold reserve capacity in the upward or the downward direction. The second key difference is in how and when ISOs procure uh, reserves, here under the heading of co-optimization. And what's imp most important here is that most ISOs, or most RTOs and ISOs are doing real-time co-optimization of energy and reserves, meaning that they're buying energy and reserves at the same time in real-time markets. But the exception to this, at least at the time of this study, was ERCOT, which means that we're using different price inputs for ERCOT than for other ISOs RTOs. Third key difference is in price cascading, which you can think about uh, more simply as how different reserve prices are related. In some uh, markets, regulation prices will always be higher than spending reserve prices, just as a function of how the constraints are set up in the ISO RTO dispatch software. In other markets, and again, ERCOT here is a good example, spinning reserve prices may be higher than regulation in some or even many hours. We'll come back to these differences when we talk about the methods and the results. A few more important issues before we get into methods and results. The first is a, a kind of a critical threshold question. Are wind and solar physically able to provide ancillary services, things like regulation and spinning reserves? As I mentioned, there's been a significant amount of research and demonstration over the past decade demonstrating that it would indeed be technically feasible to use these kinds of resources to provide frequency, frequency regulation and other operating reserves. Um, and there's some, some references here uh, for those studies. However, standalone wind and solar participation in ISO RTO AS markets has been very limited to date uh, and uh, essentially negligible. For hybrid wind and solar projects, again, with hybrids being more narrowly defined here as wind and solar paired with battery storage, ICO, ISOs, RTOs have or are in the process of developing market participation models. And I think California is probably the furthest along with this. Standalone and hybrid, and hybrid wind and solar have very different operating characteristics and economics. And it's important to tease these out a little bit before we get into the results. Um, so remember, the focus in this study is on regulation and spinning reserves. We're going to categorize these into upward reserves, which would include upward regulation and spinning reserves, downward reserves, which includes downward regulation, and bi-directional regulation. For wind and solar, how the operations and economics of AS market participation would work will vary across these different categories. There's a lot of detail in this table. I'm just going to give a, a cursory overview of some of these differences. For upward reserves, Standalone and wind and solar would need to have its schedule or dispatch curtailed, which creates an energy opportunity cost. So the resource is foregoing energy market revenues to provide reserves. Um, though it's going to earn some fraction of those lost energy revenues back when it actually provides upward regulation energy or when it's dispatched during contingency events. For downward reserves, wind and solar would not need to have its dispatch curtailed, but it would need to be curtailed by the automatic generation control system on a second to second basis to provide downward regulation energy. So the resource foregoes some real-time energy market revenues, but only for a fraction of the regulation award. 
which means that downward regulation has a much lower opportunity cost than upward regulation. From this, from, from this discussion, you can start to get a sense that there are different market price thresholds that determine whether standalone wind and solar would choose to provide reserves rather than energy. The uh, so the condition under which a standalone wind, wind or solar resource would be willing to provide upward reserves will be if the reserve price exceeds the energy price. Um, but standalone wind and solar will be more inclined to provide downward, regula downward regulation reserves so long as the energy revenues lost from providing regulation energy are less than the downward regulation price. For bidirection, bidirectional regulation, the situation is a little bit different. Wind and solar would need to have its schedule or dispatch cur 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 curtailed to provide either upward or downward regulation reserves, again, because it has to provide reserves in both directions simultaneously. This means that the condition under which standalone wind and solar would be willing to provide bidirectional regulation would be if the reserve price exceeds the energy price. And in general, this will mean that you'd expect wind, standalone wind and solar to provide fewer regulation reserves in markets with bidirectional regulation products than in markets with separate regulation products. products. Um, we'll come back to, to this again when we discuss the results. For hybrids, the economics of market participation are very different and are driven by battery economics. As illustrated in this figure, batteries like, typically like to charge up to a state of charge uh, sufficient to provide upward and downward reserves and then just sit there, unless either energy prices spike, making it economic to do energy arbitrage, or reserve prices are really low. An interesting dimension to hybrids is the is point of interconnection capacity limits, which is the maximum amount of power that the facility can inject into the grid. In our base case, we're assuming that this amount is capped at the wind or solar facility nameplate capacity, which can create some interesting and unexpected dynamics between the wind and solar facility and the battery. So for instance, if you have a 15, megawatt, uh, 15 megawatts of solar and 10 megawatts of battery capacity available in some in, in time interval, but you only have a 20 minute, a 20 megawatt peel point of interconnection limit, the total amount of energy and upward reserves that you'll be able to provide is 20 megawatt. So this will affect the battery uh, charge and discharge operations. Okay, so enough background. How do we do the analysis? Recall that the goal here was to use a relatively simple, consistent, transparent approach to explore wind and solar value across different ISO RTO markets across a few different years and for standalone and hybrid configurations of wind and solar. So to do this, we used a price taker dispatch model with per perfect foresight. This means that we assumed uh, that solar and wind participation in AS markets doesn't change AS prices and that we've assumed away a lot of the forecast and other uncertainty that characterizes the real world. So the emphasis on here is, again, is simple, con consistent and transparent. Uh, we dispatch wind and uh, solar standalone and hybrid facilities against 2015 to 2019 energy and AS my, uh, market prices in each of the seven ISOs RTOs using zonal energy and AS prices that match up to a likely uh, location of new wind and solar facilities in each ISO RTO. We use real-time energy and AS prices in all markets except for ERCOT, where, where due to differences in AS market designs that we talked about a minute ago, we're using day ahead prices instead. Our wind and solar facilities were 20 megawatts and for hybrids, we added 10 megawatts for four hour, uh, 10 megawatts of four hour battery storage capacity. So we're sizing batteries to 50% of the nameplate uh, capacity of wind and solar. And this sizing is based on, on what we're seeing in interconnection queues right now uh, for hybrids. In the base case, we only in included regulation market participation, but we expanded this to include spinning reserves in sensitivity analyses. Um, again, we looked at value from two main perspectives, resource owners and the system as a whole. For, for, um, for resource owners, our main metric for incremental value is the change in unit revenue. We're defining this as the difference in revenue between a scenario where the resource is providing both energy and reserves and a scenario in which the resource is just providing energy. Um, and we're dividing the incremental revenues by expected generation from the solar or wind facility before any curtailment. And the reason we're using this pre-curtailment denominator is that the amount of megawatt hours in the denominator will be different between the energy plus reserves and the energy cases uh, due to curtailment. So this pre-curtailment denominator 
just gives us a way to do more apples to apples comparison of the expected change in unit revenue. Uh, for system value, our main metric for incremental value is the unit value of AS provided by standalone and hybrid wind and solar resources. And again, the main question here is, are wind and solar providing reserves during periods of high AS prices? Oops, uh, this slide has a list of other assumptions we're making in, in the analysis. This is for reference. In the interest of time, uh, I'm not going to go into this in detail, um, uh, but these are here for those who are curious, um, looking back at the slides. So let's get into the results. Um, so this first set of figures shows results for standalone solar and wind for resource owners. So solar is at the top and wind is at the bottom. Uh, the bars here show incremental revenues across different historical price years. Um, and then in the tables below the figures, we have average incremental revenues in dollars per megawatt hour. And again, this is pre-curtailed megawatt hours um, uh, and then percentage change in revenues. So this is a lot of information to take in. Um, and I wanna highlight four things from these figures, four key takeaways from these figures. First, the average increase in, in incremental revenues to standalone wind and solar owners from AS market participation is in most cases, most markets relatively small. On average, across these five years, average incremental revenue uh, can be non-trivial in CalISO, ERCOT, and SPP, but is pretty negligible in all other markets. So we're talking about, you know, for, for CalISO, uh, SP, ERCOT, and SPP, we're talking somewhere in between maybe a five and to 15% change in, in revenue. So, so non-trivial, but still relatively small. Um, second key takeaway from the figures is um, that a significant part of what's driving the results, uh, the differences in results across ISOs and RTOs is market design and market rules. So remember that Cal ISO, ERCOT, and SPP have separate upward and downward regulation products rather than, rather than a bi-directional regulation product. Um, an incremental, you can see from the figure that incremental revenues are generally higher in, this, in these markets. ISO New England also has a significantly different regulation market design than, than MISO PJM in New York ISO. It has high regulation prices, but it also has a much higher number of hours in which regulation prices exceed real-time energy prices. Third key takeaway is that what's driving the interannual differences in the results, the differences between years and the figures uh, within each ISO is a more complicated mix of the relationship between energy, uh, regular energy prices, regulation prices, and the timing of wind and solar output um, and reserve prices. So for instance, the reason that incremental value is so high in ERCOT in 2019 um, is that both energy and reserve prices in that year were very high, but reserve pro prices rose more than energy prices between 2018 and 2019. So reserve prices in 2019 were high relative to other years. The CalISO's uh, steep uh, step increases from 2015 to 2016 were due to an increase in regulation procurement, which drove higher regulation prices. And then increases from 2017 to 2018 were the, were the result of an increase in regulation prices relative to energy prices. And this was a reflection of tight supply conditions. Fourth key takeaway is that the, the difference between results for wind and solar has to do with the fact uh, that wind high, has a higher capacity factor than solar. This means that it's AS market, it's unit AS market revenues, which tend to be higher than solar's in total, um, get spread or it's AS, total AS market revenues um, get spread out over a larger denominator. Um, so even though it has higher total revenues than solar, um, it, it'll be smaller on a unit basis just because it has a higher denominator. The second set of figures shows incremental value of AS market participation for hybrid owners. Note the difference in scale on the axis here between uh, the standalones and the hybrids. The incremental value for hybrids is much larger than for standalones. Based on our previous descriptions, this makes sense. And a somewhat is kind of oversimplified way to think about this is that standalone wind and solar will want to provide energy unless reserve prices are high enough to entice it to provide reserves. The batteries in hybrid facilities, on the other hand, want to provide reserves unless energy prices are higher enough to entice it to provide energy. So in some ways it makes a, a lot of sense that the value for hybrids is gonna be much higher. For hybrid, for the hybrid results, differences across ISOs, RTOs, um, 
and years are also tied to market design. Um, so for instance, SPP actually had, high, had lower regulation prices over 2015 to 2019 than MISO, but SPP has higher incremental revenues in this analysis because it has separate upward, separate upward and downward regulation products, which allows the battery to operate more efficiently and provide more regulation reserves overall uh, than, in, than in MISO. ISO New England and PJM have higher regulation prices than MISO in New York ISO, which explains why their incremental revenues are higher for hybrids. Um, as with standalones, differences between wind and solar here are the results of profiles, the timing of regulation prices, um, and capacity factors. The third set of results to show is the electricity system metrics. This table shows a metric for regulation provision. So how much regulation is the facility providing um, and our metric for system value, which if you recall is total regulation revenues divided by total provision of regulation reserves. These are based on a single year of prices, 2019. And so these are just meant to be a snapshot. The metric for regulation provision here is average, meg meg average megawatts. And the way that we calculate this is we're summing up the, the reserves provided by the facility over the year and dividing by 8,760 hours. The percent in parentheses is percent of nameplate capacity, which will be either 20 megawatts for standalones or 10 megawatts for the hybrids. For the totals here, we're summing up upward and downward regulation. For the bi-directional markets, reserve provision is going to be for both upward and downward regulation which is why with hybrids, we can get a total uh, percentage greater than 100%. The total rightmost column of the table shows average ISO RTO regulation prices for comparison with average system value. So there's a, a lot of information in this table, but I wanted to just highlight four key takeaways. The first is that standalone wind and solar provision tends to be much higher in ISOs and RTOs that have separate upward and downward uh, regulation products. A 20 megawatt facility in SPP, for instance, will provide an average of about 1.3 megawatts of downward regulation, whereas that 20 megawatt facility in MISA would provide an average of, of about one of 0 0.3 megawatts. Second key takeaway is that standalone wind often provides more regulation reserves than standalone solar, um, but hybrid solar often provides slightly more reserves than hybrid wind. There isn't really a clear pattern in, of, in the val for the value of reserves. You know, is the value of hybrid uh, or is the value of solar provided uh, higher than the value of wind for providing reserves? This appears to be a little bit more market specific. Third key takeaway is that the value of hybrids is often a bit higher than standalone, though interestingly, not always. So, for instance, standalone resources have higher value in P PJM and ISO New England. This probably isn't entirely a fair comparison because it reflects some amount of averaging. In PJM and, and ISO New England, standalones are providing reserves in, in a limited number of high value hours, whereas hybrids are providing reserves in a much larger number of hours. So this is, in, in some, to some extent, this is this, the lower value of, of hybrids in these markets is a result of averaging a higher denominator. Um, but it does illustrate that enabling standalone wind and solar to provide regulation reserves could be helpful in expanding the options available to system operators during periods when the system is constrained and has high reserve prices. Um, and then the last key takeaway is that the value for both standalones and hybrids tends to be higher than average um, ISO RTO regulation process, prices, though again, uh, not always. What this suggests, at least directionally, is that Number one, standalone hybrid and uh, standalone and hybrid wind and solar can, can both provide high value uh, regulation reserves. And number two, that allowing wind and solar to participate in regulation markets could help put downward pressure on regulation prices by providing reserves when prices are high. We looked at four main sensitivities in the analysis. Uh, first, increasing this point of interconnection capacity limit in the hybrid cases from 20 megawatts to 30 minute megawatts. So 30 megawatts will be the combined uh, nameplate capacity of, of wind and solar plus the battery. Um, second sensitivity was allowing resources to provide both regulation and spinning reserves in addition to energy. 
third sensitivity was allowing resources to pro provide only spinning reserves in addition to energy. And then lastly, we also ran a, a high uh, VRE penetration sensitivity that compares the results of, of low VRE and high VRE scenarios using 2030 price forecasts. So um, for the first three sensitivities, we're using 2018 ISO RTO prices. So we're not looking at all years. This is, again, this is just a snapshot. And for the high VRE penetration sensitivity, we're using LCG price forecasts from uh, L for 2030 from LBNL study on um, impacts of high renewable, high variable renewable energy futures on wholesale electricity prices. So this is a study that LBNL um, did in 2019, I believe. Um, so we're comparing in this in this high VRE penetration sensitivity, we're comparing low and high uh, renewable scenarios for 2030 price forecast. The high renewables <clears throat> scenario that we're using for the, in this high VRE sense penetration sensitivity has 20% wind and 20% solar across the four different markets that were included in the study. Oops. Um, so this table shows results for the first three sensitivities, including the base case, so you can get a sense for what the deltas are. Again, there's a lot of information here, so I wanted to focus on a couple main takeaways. First, with a couple of except, exceptions, so ISO New England PJM, the value of increasing the point of interconnection limit is pretty low, which implies that at least in this battery sizing, so 50% of, of nameplate solar and wind capacity, most of the AS value of hybrids can be captured without needing to increase a wind or solar facilities interconnection capacity limit. So that's pretty interesting. Second key takeaway from this is for wind and solar, for standalone wind and solar, the value of participating in spinning reserve markets is pretty low. This is partly due to price cascading, which if uh, you recall means that in several markets, regulation prices will always exceed spinning reserve prices and partly due to low spinning reserve prices. For hybrids, the spinning reserve story is a little bit more complex, um, but outside of perhaps ERCOT, the incremental value of spinning reserves is still pretty low. So what this means is that at least with the current structure of AS market prices, most of the value of AS market participation will be in regulation reserves. And then after that, there's a pretty big drop off in value for spinning reserves. The high VRE penetration sensitivity is, is pretty interesting. Again, the low VRE scenarios are not comparable, comparable to the previous results we showed because these are 2030 price, for, price forecasts rather than actual. There will always be, will be a difference between sort of production simulation based forecast and, and market value. But you can see from this that from the high VRE scenario, um, there's a significantly higher value than in the low VRE scenario. And there are two reasons for this. The first is that AS prices uh, increase significantly from the low VRE to the high VRE scenario for, for most markets in these price forecasts. So for instance, in SBP, the uh, regulation goes from around $4 a megawatt in, in the low VRE scenario to around $27 a megawatt in the high VRE scenario. And, and this reflects a higher number of hours where the SBP system is downward constrained. Second reason is that the structure between energy and AS prices changes between the low and high VRE scenarios. So we have a much larger number of hours where regulation prices exceed energy prices. So for instance, in ERCOT, the number of hours where regulation up exceeds energy goes from around 100 in the low VRE scenario to around 1,500 in the high VRE scenario. Um, it's important to point out that these results are based on price forecasts and that they're directional. Um, and importantly, the scenarios here do not include increases in energy storage, which would tend to depress these values. And we'll come back to that in a second. The results in the analysis are sensitive to three more qualitative questions that we, take, that we took up in the report. First, will wind and solar be able to participate in AS markets? Or even if they, they can, would there be other barriers that might limit their participation in these markets? To the first part of this question, most ISOs, RTOs would likely need to change their market rules to allow wind and solar per to participate in AS markets. This is definitely the case for standalone resources, but it's also the, likely to be the case for lots of uh, kinds of hybrid resources. To the second part of this question, we need to better understand how things like forecast uncertainty 
or lost production tax credit value might affect decision making for resource owners. There's some ongoing and interesting work at NREL looking into the uncertainty uh, part of that. Second question um, is how, uh, how would higher wind and solar penetrations and more wind, solar and storage participation in AS markets affect the results? And these two things are work in opposing directions. As the high uh, VRE penetration sensitivity in this analysis illustrates, in power systems with higher levels of renewables, we'd expect to see more value from wind and solar participation in AS markets. But by the same token, allowing wind and solar and particularly storage to participate in AS markets would tend to drive AS prices lower, reducing, or reducing value. The table on the right here shows regulation and spinning reserve requirements by ISO RTO in 2017 and standalone and hybrid energy storage in ISO RTO interconnection queues as of 2020. What this tells you is that if, even if only a fraction of the storage in interconnection queues gets built, it will likely lead to reserve market saturation. This is both because reserve markets tend to be relatively thin, um, particularly for regulation markets, and because we, uh, we have currently a lot of storage in interconnection queues. But how these dynamics between higher AS value, higher AS demand and value, um, as we start to see higher penetrations of renewables, um, and then higher amounts of resources that can provide AS, and particularly in the case of storage that actually specialize in providing reserves, um, how these dynamics will evolve is still unclear. And then the third question is whether there might be new AS products that would provide an additional sources of revenues uh, to resource owners. We describe a few uh, potential emerging AS products in the report, um, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into them in detail here. Um, so I'll close with, with three overarching conclusions from the study. The first is that the value of wind and solar participation in AS markets varies significantly by resource type and across ISO RTO markets. In markets with separate uh, upward and downward regulation products, incremental revenues to standalone wind and solar owners were non-trivial, so on the order of 5 to 15% in Cal ISO, ERCOT, and SPP. Um, but in markets with bi-directional regulation, incremental revenues were pretty negligible. The value to re hybrid resource owners is much higher than for standalone owners. In some ways, just given the, the way that, that storage operates in, in energy market and reserve markets, this is to be expected. Um, second conclusion is that the differences uh, uh, across ISO markets are the result, mainly the result of resource mix and market price structure and market design, and particularly whether ISO's RTOs have separate upward and downward or, uh, regulation products or bi-directional regulation products. With higher and wind solar penetrations, the value of having these resources participate in, in mark, AS markets will likely rise, but at the same time, expanding AS market participation to wind, solar, and storage would tend to saturate these markets and depress prices. We don't have a lot of intuition yet for how the dynamics of these two trends would play out in the future. This is an important area of research. Um, next, uh, an, an, uh, an additional conclusion is that both stole, uh, standalone and hybrid wind and solar can provide resources, provide reserves during periods of high AS prices. And this suggests that regardless of how we think the future will, will evolve, there may be uh, value in the near term in allowing these resources to provide regulation and spinning reserves. Um, and then the last conclusion is that the results of this analysis provide some useful insights for ISOs, RTOs, as they think about enabling wind and solar participation in AS markets. For ISOs, RTOs that do not have separate upward and downward regulation products, so that's MISO, New York ISO, PJM, and New York and ISO New England, the results here show that a useful first step in, in trying to enable wind and solar um, and, and storage participation uh, in AS markets would be to create separate products, separate upward and downward regulation products. This would create more value for both resource owners and for the system as a whole by enabling resources that can most efficiently provide reserves in either direction to do so. The results here also show that the value of enabling uh, hybrid uh, and, and storage participation in AS markets would generally exceed that for standalone wind and solar. So a first step maybe uh, for ISO's RTOs may be to focus on making sure that hybrids can participate in AS markets. So there's a lot of work uh, in this direction under FERC 840, under 841.
but hybrids and standalone resources will relieve different times, kinds of system constraints. So for instance, you may want to use standalone solar to provide downward regulation reserves during periods when energy and reserve prices are both low. Um, so ultimately, it would probably be advantageous to enable uh, AS market participation by both wind and solar, hybrids and solar, and standalone resources. Um, so with that, uh, I'll wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, and we'll open things up for Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Fritz. And <clears throat> please do, folks, um, add your questions to that Q&A box. We have a number of them that have started to show up there. But uh, yeah, please keep adding them to that box, and we'll, we'll try to get uh, to all of them. Um, so just to kind of start kicking things off, maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of the methods and questions that have come in around that. Uh, so maybe I'll start off with the first question headed over towards James. Um, so James, for the hybrid systems, did you assume that the energy storage component was only per permitted to charge from the wind and solar resource, um, or, or was there uh, grid charging allowed in, in the cases that you analyzed? Yeah, that's a great question. And in the current study that we allow the energy storage is only from the wind and solar resources. So the, the energy charging components for the energy storage when it's collocated uh, with wind and solar and the energy charged on that hybrid system is from the solar or wind generated energy sources. But at the same time, we, we acknowledge that there is a hybrid system that is charging from the grid directly in this case. <clears throat> Okay, and then uh, to Fritz, another question, just to clarify some, um, just was it was it assumed that the projects can participate in all of the products across all of the markets, or what, what were some of the assumptions on which which products they were able to do? So in the base case, were were um, the the standalone and hybrid facilities are are just providing energy. Then in in the in the main sort of analysis case, we're assuming that they can provide regulation in addition to energy, so ener both energy and regulation. Um, and then in the sensitivities, we're allowing them to, per to, to provide energy regulation um, and spinning reserves. Um, or in the, in the second sensitivity, just energy and spinning reserves. Um, so we're not allowing them to provide uh, not uh, other AS products in addition to that. Uh, but we did look at those three sort of scenarios for, for energy and AS products. And, and related to that, maybe we'll start off with James again, um, and then and then Fritz, if you have anything else to add to it. Um, just in the in that regulation and spin case, what portion of the capacity of the that that uh, storage that was available um, bids into the regulation market, and what portion uh, bids into the spin market? Yeah, that's that's um, probably operational question, and it's it's the same as the like energy only or energy plus regulation or energy plus regulation plus in provision. So the dispatch decision by the energy storage is based on the price signal from the market. So which means we do not have a specific portion of the energy storage to provide either regulation or either for spin, but the dispatch decision that how many megawatts to provide the regulation or spin is based on the price signal from the market. So which means if the price is higher and high enough to provide the regulation or spin in the case of the providing regulation and spin at the, um, altogether, is based on the price. So we do not specify any portion of the capacity to specific market type. Yeah, and so the way that we're doing this is we're, we're effectively co-optimizing energy regulation and spinning reserves in that case. And, and what's typical across ISO RTO markets is that given that regulation prices are, are much higher than spin, that spinning reserve prices that you end up uh, uh, in, you'll, you'll provide energy and regulation most of the time. And then in a couple of high price spin hours, you may provide spinning reserves. But in general, because the regulation prices will be higher than spinning reserves, you, the spinning reserve provision is low in most markets. It's not true for ERCOT. And so ERCOT, there's a couple of markets where this dynamic between energy regulation and spinning reserves is a little bit more interesting. Great. Um, and then just some specifics on the spinning reserves. This is another question to James. Um, 
what what was the definition of the spinning reserve in terms of the the times uh, i guess and i think there's two elements to this sort of what's the response time how quickly do you have to be able to deploy and then also if you could speak to how uh, the duration of that deployment totally so yeah so to those two time elements the first one the reaction or response time we assume that it can be instantaneous. So, which means um, the flexibility of the energy storage and also the standalone that advanced inverter can provide spin reserve in instance. So there's no like response time that is supposed to be lagged. So that's one. And the duration of the spinning reserve, I think we specify them in the, the manuscript on, in the table five for the people who are interested in more details. But those spinning reserves in this case is um, under one hour, which means KAISO is 30 minutes and has PP um, 60 minutes, um, et cetera, et cetera. And since we are running this model in a early model and those spinning reserve require, um, or continuation of the duration requirement for the spinning reserve uh, under a hour, so that's how it is um, assumed and defined in the model run. And I guess one thing just to add on that. So um, uh, because we're doing this uh, with hourly market prices, um, there's part of, you know, if, if, you're, if you have an hour uh, duration requirement for your spinning reserves, um, you're probably going to want to, you know, reduce, derate the amount of, of the wind and solar forecast that you'd allow to, pro to, to provide upward spinning reserves. And so we're doing that uh, on the, the sort of the amount of, of wind and solar that's being allowed to provide reserves rather than on the, the how much gets, uh, or I guess the, the, the reserve uh, price or product side. So we're assuming that only 20% of of the uh, wind and solar forecast for standalone resources is able to provide spin, spinning reserves. Great, okay. <clears throat> and then just one question, just to kind of maybe recap a couple of things, just in terms of, again, could you talk about um, uh, which ancillary service product is contributing to the revenue gain for standalone solar and, uh, and wind? So that's uh, regulation. Yeah, great. Regulation okay. reserves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so now um, maybe let's start to move a little bit into some of these broader questions. Um, and, and I think probably a lot of these are going to be directed to Fritz. Um, but again, James, maybe if you want to weigh in with anything. Um, so the first one, just again, on, on ability to provide, um, <clears throat> are there any particular ISO tariffs that allow VREs to participate in ancillary service markets? Um, or, or, you know, is this just not even possible because they lack the flexibility and dispatchability um, without um, the, the, uh, the storage component? Um, so I think maybe the way to think about this is that the, the in terms of feasibility, uh, I, th I think the Cal, recent Cal ISO studies and, and um, other studies show that you, you can have standalone wind and solar providing both downward and upward reserves. Um, uh, in terms of the tariffs, I think the way that most of the tariffs are currently written, they're ambiguous, meaning they don't, in most cases, they don't explicitly rule out having uh, standalone wind and solar or even, you know, hybrid wind and solar um, participating in AS markets, but they don't um, provide, and this is both tariffs and, and the uh, manuals, they don't provide guidance on what, on what the requirements for, for wind and solar facilities would be to certify, to provide, to qualify to provide reserves. And so I think that step, having having more guidance for resources for for forecast based resources, for here the here you know here's how we're going to treat you for reserve provision, uh, would probably be necessary to allow uh, stand and both standalone and hybrids to participate in AS markets. And then, um, can you foresee one of these questions is kind of looking at specific types of hybrids, um, do, do you foresee any sort of hydro and storage hybrids? And would that sort of utilize the existing hydro infrastructure in that case? Um, so high, I'm assuming this is run of river hydro rather than reservoir hydro. So reservoir hydro can provide reserve, it can and does provide uh, reserves. Um, for run of river hydro, you could also, uh, you could also um, uh, um, envision that run of river hydro plus storage or just run of river hydro also participating in AS markets. Um, 
I think it would, in, it would probably, you know, there might be some differences with wind and solar, but, but it seems reasonable to expect that you could um, do that as well. Okay, <clears throat> I think um, where we're gonna start to move now is a little bit more towards this uh, future services and sort of future expectations as to, to where these markets will head. Um, and so, so one of them on, on a, a bit more on the technical side of this is trying to understand the value of, of things like grid stability and system strength, uh, especially like the fault current ability of synchronous generators. Is there a market value for this anywhere? Um, uh, or is this something where, um, you know, that, that people are starting to require like synchronous condensers in some locations and things like that. So where, where what's sort of the, the role of those emerging uh, types of ancillary services um, and challenges? Um, so I, I, let me see if I've understood the question. So the, the question is, are for, for emerging kind of um, uh, uh, primary frequency related uh, um, issues or, or are there emerging markets? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, I think it's asking if there's market values for some of these. And in particular, this one is sort of around grid stability and system mm -hmm. strength. Um, so for a lot of ISOs, RTOs, they do not have mark. The only, you know, the only mark products that they have are currently are for secondary and tertiary control reserves. So regulation and operating reserves. Um, and then, um, uh, then they also have um, uh, uh, a bilateral procurement of, of um, voltage support and black start capacity. So for a lot of things that you might envision needing um, in a high wind and solar future, we don't have products for them yet. And when we go just talk about this a little bit in the report, I think in general, the, cons the emerging consensus seems to be that like regulation, the size of markets for these products would probably be relatively small. Um, and so what's likely to be the case is that yes, you could probably make the case that that uh, wind and solar could provide a lot of these services. And I guess the question, um, and we don't necessarily answer this in the report, but we kind of try to point in the right direction is that, um, uh, is that the market for these products is relatively, gonna be relatively small relative to the, the energy market and capacity markets. Great. <clears throat> And then I think one of the, the next questions is, um, you know, are, are there any sort of forecasts or expectations for what will happen to ancillary service prices once a large number of batteries come online? Um, and, and it seems that, you know, a lot of battery projects that have been coming online recently are, you know, sort of motivated by trying to receive these ancillary service, ancillary service revenues. And so what, what effect might that have on, on prices? Um, so I think that in general, you know, if you if you think about a future without the, a lot of the storage that's in the interconnection queue coming online, we'd expect uh, ancillary service market prices to increase with increasing penetrations of wind and solar. You just have a lot a, a higher number of hours where the system is constrained, which it will tend to increase AS prices. But that being said, with with all of this storage that's in the pipeline. Um, it's unclear, you know, um, it's unclear what will happen to market prices. And, and if, all, if all of this storage comes online, what you'd expect is that, that it would depress ancillary service market prices. But I think, you know, what we don't really understand is what the sort of what these two trends imply over the next maybe five years. You know, at what point would, would having a lot of um, storage come online depress uh, market prices and what what's the window for wind and solar to to be able to and storage to be able to make uh, money from from reserve markets. Yeah, and and I guess maybe um, along that line, you know, is there anything sort of that suggests that uh, regulation and spinning reserve markets will uh, increase significantly in their volume with higher VRE penetration? Right. So, so the other question is what the size of these markets are of, of um, uh, regulation spinning reserve markets might look like over time. So in principle, you'd think that, that they should, that uh, ISOs, RTOs would increase the amount of both regulation and spinning reserves that they're buying. Um, regulation, because we will see a lot more variability on sort of that sub five minute interval, 
um, and spinning reserves maybe to some extent to deal with forecast error. Um, but the, how much is is relatively uncertain at this point. And I think there's there's at least some work going on uh, under DOE right now to try to better answer this question. Um, but over the last five years, you know, there hasn't been a significant increase in the amount of, of uh, reserves that, that a lot of ISOs, RTOs are, are procuring, even with increases in wind and solar generation. The exception to that might be Cal ISO. And then, and then this kind of, I think, kind of brings back to some of the earlier points too, is just, um, you know, so, so there's, there's the potential change in volume of those current products, but are there new AS products that we think will be needed to support such high penetrations of renewables um, and, and, you know, do we have any sort of sense of the implications of that? Um, so I think there, the answer is probably yes, that, that we're going to find new, uh, that ISOs, RTOs are going to find new, new reserve needs um, on different time scales. It's sort of unclear at this point what those might be. Cal ISO is a good place to, to look to think about what the what those reserve products might look like. So the Cal ISO in, in, its, in its day ahead market um, uh, reform uh, process was, was uh, considering uh, creating an, an imbalanced reserve product to, to deal with um, forecast error on sort of a longer, a day ahead um, time scale. So that might be for, uh, that's an example of one type of, of AS product that might be needed in the future. The value of these products is, is also somewhat unclear um, and, and is also a, a great area of, of future res research. So, you know, on a day, particularly on a day ahead uh, time scale. Um, and if we're, in, if we're, um, uh, if these reserves are, are impacting unit commitment decisions, it's, in, it's unclear what, what the, you know, how, how, what the value of these reserve products is. I think intuition right now is that they probably still, you know, the, the um, regulation is still probably a higher uh, value uh, reserve than, um, than a lot of other products, that even the new products that the ISOs, RTOs would be creating. Um, but I think there's a, a lot more uh, research that's needed on this topic. Great. And, and then it uh, looks like the final question here before we wrap up, it, it's just going to go back into the results and maybe kind of put these results a little bit more into context. Um, and so we, we've, we've quantified the in the charts, the sort of gain in revenue from participating in ancillary services in terms of dollars per megawatt hour. Um, but could you just say sort of what does this mean in terms of the total revenue that um, that these uh, resources are, are expected to to get? And how does how does this sort of like answer a service revenue compared to energy and capacity revenue? Right. So the the percentages are 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 sort of on the five to 15 percent uh, in the five to 15 percent range for Cal ISO, SPP um, and ERCOT. Um, so that's percentage increase in in revenues. Um, so I'd, 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 the the totals will depend on the size of the project, but that should give us a sort of sort of, sort of sense of relative scale of of how what this would be for a um, uh, for a uh, wind or solar resource that's participating in AS markets. Whether this is you know high you know we started with this question of is this going to be high enough to offset declines in energy and capacity market value in in places like Cal ISO. I think five to 15% is probably not on its own going to be high enough to offset those values. And so there's this question still of what the business model, as we get in places like California, as the system becomes increasingly saturated with solar, what are, what are the business models for solar, um, solar developers? How do these evolve? Um, and to what extent, you know, uh, as hybrid projects, increasing number of hybrid projects come online, um, to what extent, uh, you know, is hybrid, hybrid AS market participation a, a part of those business models? I think for, for, for hybrid resources, the ability to participate in AS markets is going to be critical to the, to the, to the business model. Um, but for standalone resources, it's, it's sort of this question is still relatively open. What is, you know, what is the business model um, as these resources become uh, uh, larger shares of the generation mix? Great. Thanks so much, Fritz. And uh, Fritz, if you wouldn't mind, I think the next slide has our contact information. Is that, that is correct? correct. <clears throat> One second.
just pull that up. Great, yeah. Um, so uh, really appreciate everybody's participation today and, and, and Fritz and James for your um, great responses to these questions. It's been a really nice discussion. Um, it, we're happy to kind of follow up and continue this conversation if there's additional questions that come up or folks wanna reach out. Um, you see here James's contact information uh, on the slide. Um, you can reach out directly to him and, and he'll direct questions uh, to, to us and others as necessary or we'll answer those. Um, again, you can go to our publications page if you want to find um, uh, the, the links to uh, publications like this and, and other ones. Um, I'm going to put one more time into the chat just the, the link to this report uh, and the PowerPoint slides uh, so that you have that. But really want to, again, appreciate everybody for joining us today, and we'll look forward uh, to, to hearing from you in, in future uh, presentations too. All right, thanks, everybody. Have a great day.